Please, uh, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to Houston. I, I feel like I have a new family uh, here. I um, want to thank all those who are involved in making this iteration of the exhibition happen. Uh, Janice, uh, Siva, Hesse, Elise, Patricia, um, Philip, all the amazing merchandise you see for the show. Um, the design, uh, the amazing install team here. Uh, it's truly been a journey because we started talking about this exhibition, I want to say in like 2019. Um, a lot has changed since then. Uh, and before we even get into it, I do want to uh, acknowledge the unfortunate uh, incident that occurred yesterday in another part of Texas. And the unfortunate incident that happened last week in Buffalo. And so I just want to take a moment of silence to acknowledge those that we lost um, before we get into the conversation. Uh, thank you. So, soul of life, folks. Oh, got to thank Mary Ann here. Ben and Camille, uh, all the incredible lenders. Um, it definitely was a village, Nina, um, Nyla, Jane. Um, it definitely was a village to put this exhibition together. Um, it started at Moab with Manetta, who I saw someplace. Oh, yeah, Manetta. Right here. Don't be shy. <laughs> um, so we started the first iteration of the exhibition. Um, in San Francisco at Moab, it was important for us to start this exhibition at a black institution um, who was doing incredible work in the Bay Area. And then this is the second iteration. Uh, I know some of you guys may have seen the San Francisco iteration, but it's double in size. And I learned the other night from Hesse, uh, it's the largest presentation of Omarco's work to date. to 2022. We have this site-specific mural that was made specifically for this exhibition. Once this exhibition goes down, this disappears. So make sure that you spend time with it, tell your friends and family to come see it. We, we wanted to do something special for this edition of the exhibition. Uh, but with that, I think a Marco, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Yeah? Uh, by the look of James, I'm grateful. Yeah, I'm happy to have all these cases here uh, to celebrate. I'm grateful. So, oh, Lester. <laughs> <laughs> I love Lester. <laughs> I mean, you rarely find people who are like truly passionate about art, passionate about artists. Um, and from when we met, I was like, okay, I've been to know this guy for a long time. Um, good heart. Um, so this exhibition came to be, uh, as I said, we started these conversations around 2019. And, you know, Mark and I have known each other for a number of years, and I kind of saw what was happening with his career. And, you know, most people who engage with the work, it's been online. If you're lucky to have seen a solo show at Marianne's Gallery, like Venice Gallery, um, but for most people, they haven't seen this much work uh, in one space. And for me, it was important that we created an institutional dialogue around the work that he was doing, because what he was doing is important. And for me, it's rare to kind of see this continual shift in evolution in real time. Um, usually, it's something that we look over someone's career of 20, 30 years, and maybe to kind of assess. And so it's, I guess, because we kind of live in a social media era and everything is kind of like immediate, you know, I, I, I knew it was important that we put together the same show. And so, thinking about W.E.B. Du Bois' book, written in 1903, I felt like what Marco was doing through his work was this ethnographic study, this ethnographic look of black life, 
um, contemporary black life, thinking about black subjectivity, black joy, and you know, as he even says it, you know, making a painting. We have some people who write, some people who make poems. He makes paintings about these ideas, these feelings, these moods, frustration, joy. But really, I think what's been interesting to kind of observe is his desire to create the narrative of how he wants black and brown folks to be seen. Um, and so I guess my first question to you, you know, we're both from Ghana, we grew up in Ghana. Can you talk about how Ghana influenced you as a person? How do you think about art? How do you see the world? Um, well, first of all, thank you. Um, for me, Ghana is a space where I have a lot of freedom because you know, I, I kind of have to work with what I have or what I get. So I don't have endless resources, resources in, in terms of things that I want to do. So, but then of course it's an exit, so it's a advantage, but then I kind of think of it differently that, you know, I have all this space and I decide to do whatever I want to do with it. And I tell myself that these are the things that I decide that I want to do to do the things I want to do. And so from that perspective, I got so much freedom and that, you know, is how I see that. Mm -hmm. And then, grew up in Ghana, went to Ganata. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Ganata was an art school that many of the, you know, prominent figurative artists that you're seeing coming from Ghana. They were all same class, above, around, it's probably like 20, maybe more. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of like if you're in tech, it's like they got mafia for art. <laughs> um, and can you talk about that program? Because like there are a lot of art schools in Ghana, but this one was really special. Yeah, I mean, the sad thing is that Ganata is not there anymore. Um, but Ganata is a space where they teach you the basics of drawing, painting, uh, shading, whatever you need to know in terms of drawing and painting. Um, and, you know, the way they teach you, it's like, you know, they do with you. It's not, it's more practice based. It's more practice based. So you, you get to do it all the time. You have a competition, you have a history, you have to actually get the thing. So that's what I'm to about for me, like getting the basics right. So was it there you realized that you wanted to take art seriously as a career? Or was it before? Or was it something you always kind of felt you wanted to do? Uh, I was not going to be in theater. Mm -hmm. For me, theater was. Yeah, okay. Um, I had wanted to do art, yes, but you know, I didn't get the time to tell you. So, tennis where I came from, so tennis was my way out, so I made it my best out. Um, and then later on, I got a chance to go back to school, and I was like, yeah, this is something I would love to do, so maybe I'll just go do it. So in case I make, you know, I make that good name and good money from tennis, at least I can, you know, get some hobby. And then, uh, and so I went back to school to study art. And when I actually took it serious was when I wanted to go back to tennis and I quit. You know, I would just stay home and paint. Uh, I was finding difficult to just go to the court to play. And then at some point when I did, the people that I started with were fired, so I was like, yeah, I guess I may have to stick to painting then. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. And so, studying in Ganata, and you also studied in Vienna. And can you talk about how both of those experiences kind of inform how you've gotten to this point? Well, Ganata teaches you the basics. You see, you know, the, the right basic fundamentals for drawing. Um, Vienna, um, my first team gives you the freedom to experiment. So, what I got from Vienna, I also, you know, I got stuck to 
having you have to receive a resolution like this is what you're supposed to do, and this is how you're supposed to turn up. Or by the dinner, it's like, okay, well, you have the space, do what you can do, this and this, and let's have a conversation. So you have all the freedom to extend and you have the space to do whatever you want to do. Uh, first semester wasn't, wasn't easy because I didn't know how to you know, uh, play with that freedom. And so I did a little bit and then I you know, kind of figured out that I need to have my own language because you know, in other, I, I kind of, I don't know how I got there, but I was like, I have to convince myself that learning or knowing the basics of painting is good, and that should give me the edge to actually start my learning because you know it already. Mm -hmm. And so from there, that's when I decided I wanted to start my own language. I had to get it. I knew I had to try a whole lot, and that's where it began. And so there, that's when you began the shift from painting your figures with the brush with your fingers. And so when you look at the exhibition, uh, Black Skin, White Mask, um, it's the only painting in the show that's all acrylic. It's all brushwork. And so one thing that was important as we were talking about the show is like, how do we kind of illustrate the art and the journey? Because I think a lot of people you know, come to the work recently I think it happened overnight. And I think it was important for us to kind of show that there's a process of him figuring it out. And I commend him because, you know, I think, you know, you're basically being very vulnerable at a very early point in your career. Normally it's like mid career, sort of the retrospective, you kind of see the bumps and the bruises that the artists went through to get to where they are. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about, I guess, what was the catalyst to kind of move away from the brush to make the skin and more think? I, we talk about sculpting, sculpting the skin. And you talk about like simplifying the process for yourself so that the viewer actually is able to get more from your work with the experience. I mean, I like, I like brush painting. One of the tools that I learned painting, so I got comfortable with it. Um, but brush work didn't really give me, at some point, it didn't give me what I was looking for because I wanted to do painting on a surface where there's feels like endless possibilities and feels like an endless movement that you know you can edit every stage or angle that you look at. There's something interesting happening there. My control with the brush wouldn't allow me to get there. So I had to you know, find different ways to do it. I did not get the thing of I it. I didn't think of the thing as a tool to paint with. Mm -hmm. It just happened that I was invited for a video uh, uh, clip, a music video clip, where they wanted like uh, they want to take some material from me painting to add video and so in this video when it came I did uh, I started with the sketch and I thought that would be it and then I would do the painting when they come I was able to do it just right in time they put the video in the time but they wanted more material so I was like okay let me just give them something I I think I have few other colors in the studio because I, I paint with acrylic and I was trying to shift from acrylic to oil, and I couldn't get through because oil for me oil was very really slow, and I wanted something sparkling and worth it. Um, so I had oil, but I never tried to. So I was like, I'm just gonna do this, and then once they go, I will do a new sketch, do the painting, and then they will come for the final video, and then we can. But when they left, I sat down, and I was like, this is cool. I mean, I, it, it, it gave me something. It was freedom, it was flat, it was not tall because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. But it felt cool. So I finished that painting, we finished the video, and I went back to my brush painting again. And then I, a friend of mine sent me this uh, competition, what I wish I painting to write. They only accepted my work, and I think the deadline was in three days. 
found me like the right word and he was giving me like a few opportunities to finish. And so I was like, ah, you know, he just came back. I was like, okay, I tried this technique and it didn't really do. I'm just gonna go back and see how to, you know, do it again. So I bought some papers, some oils, because I also had this friend that I um, was you know, studying in the States, and I would just do whatever I, I like mixing stuff up. And it'd be like, if he will, like he wants to work with me, so he will just buy the right ingredients to mix with oil, and so the right stuff, and like, you know, they would have wanted it. And so he introduced me to those ingredients. And then, you know, I just did two sketch next to the, the painting, and then I applied the, for, the, for, the deal, uh, for the award. I did not get the award, I got the jury award, which for me was like the artistic proof. I mean, like, it felt a bit good because, you know, they accepted it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's always good to, you know, when you start something new, you have to go through like the proof because as much as you feel confident in it and you like it, you still want some, um, you know, some acceptance. Mm -hmm. And it, it felt good that an institution kind of saw it and they recognized it. And so was that one of the first, um, Affirming moments where yeah. you were like, okay, yeah, I got right. something. I'm heading right direction. Okay, yeah. okay. And then, as I mentioned before, we have work from 2016 to 2022. Can you talk a little bit about how things have evolved for you? So, like, we start with the self portrait. So, a lot of this this way of working, this strategy started with the self portraits. Why did you start with you as a subject on the journey of? Building your language. Well, back in Ghana, I'm, I'm part of the Black Nigeria that you know with, with black, so I don't have to clean with black. But when I arrived in Ghana, their idea is and notions about black people is different, and so I felt the agency to do something to change that narrative. Um, I remember doing works where I was mostly complaining about you know why they see black. And I somehow was like, maybe I should just show them how I want to be seen. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started with the self portrait, which, uh, because I felt like, you know, it's, as much as I know it's a group of people that's this and that, I wanted, you know, I felt it more, and I wanted to change it, so I thought I should just start with myself. And so then you did these self portraits, and then when did you say, okay, let me shift and start painting my friends and painting people I admire, people I respect? Um, I think I had two friends that were like, you know, just go by yourself and paint other people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I think if you paint yourself, so many times you just get, you know, you just like for it. Um, but it did got me to start looking at other, other people doing interesting stuff. So that's how I started. And then it grew from there to, you know, just looking at image, like, and that image informed me how I thought, how I wanted to be seen. So sometimes it's not just characters that I paint, but characters that I actually see myself through them. Okay. So is that how you choose the people you want to pay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And basically, you know, people doing amazing things or being space are for others to just go at this thing. So those are the things that I look for. And besides obviously the, the figure, the rending of the skin, color is a very important part of the practice. Um, these shapes, I was talking to someone and they Call it negative space, and I just feel like that's not the right word. But your use of negative space with these voids, I mean, even with this piece here with the pets, it, it amplifies, I guess, how you engage with the figure. Can you talk about why color is such an important component of the practice? Fashion is such an important part of the practice. And for the shirt, this woman's dress on um, the red towel. I mean, 
for me, passion is a statement. It's it's a way you know someone feels and it, it, it has it for it adds up certain it adds up something for me. You know mm-hmm. when when I dress or when I see people dress well, it gives me that self confidence. You know I want to walk in with a shop. I mean I might. Say all the wrong stuff, but fashion kind of, you know. You know what I mean? That, that's not my thing. Um, my area of paintings, I used a bit of gold when I was a beginner, and you know, it, it wasn't bad, but it's just that the, um, gave this one as a beginner that I, you know, had not experienced a lot. But I feel like my most of the Painting that I did earlier on didn't have anything to do with him, mm-hmm. but just the use of gold, it, it, like it cleaned it, like you know, that you use. Ah, it's nice, you know, getting to clean it. Like, well, Ghana is gold coast, so if, if anyone is right to use gold, it should be me. Yeah. <laughs> but clean that, I already cleaned it, so I had to, you know, move away from it because I want to get as and I want to be able to just you know, show my work in a way that it's not so connected to what I need. Okay. And so, but also I want to be, I understand earlier on that, you know, I don't want too many things happening because I want the pizza to be the main focus. Okay. And so I had to like take away anything that I felt like was going to distract the figure. And that's how I started playing with this monochrome colors like you know if I pick like this uh to pink for example I will want to pick play with the shades now until it only complements the work. Okay. And that goes back to the simplicity that you talked about earlier. And why is that important? Because I think for me, you know, so most people ask how did we meet them? We met their mutual friend who also happens to be a painter. Uh, Kehinde okay, Wai, and um, Kehinde okay, I've known him for a long time, and he never messages me. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, there's this kid from your country, I think you should look at his work. Um, but it's interesting, you know, as a, a young artist, I guess the desire is always to put more data and information into the painting, but you actually want to simplify it and take more away. And, and but why is that important? Because for me, part of the process of doing this show is also trying to figure out why is his practice cutting through in a way that you know maybe another artist doesn't. What is it about his ability to get to the essence of capturing a person's not even likeness but just energy that's special? And I guess that's, that part of that is that simplicity. Yeah, I mean it is. Like, if you look at the brush work from 2016, yeah. I mean, it has some energies, but it's not the same. Um, I think when people say less and they show more, there's, there's, some, there's some power in it. Mm-hmm. I wanted the characters to, you know, to have that, that look, like just by looking, you know, it, it's, it's saying everything. I want them to dress in a way that when they appear, they don't have to say anything. It's, it's already there. And then piggybacking, because I'm sure a lot of people want to know the process. So, my favorite piece was with me and Pete. Pink. That's so fun. I've been calling it the couch. I guess that's the American in me. But, um, Talk to us about the process of making these. Because um, you talk a lot about, you know, you're actually, it actually kind of reminds me of like Jay-Z's approach to making a song, where you say you're making the painting in your head. And once you kind of know what you want to do, like I literally watched you do this, and it's like a conductor, you know, conducting an orchestra. I've just, I've never seen it before, and I've seen a lot of paintings, but can you talk a little bit about Without giving away the secret sauce. No, I mean, there's some painters in here, so, <laughs> with the process. 
I mean, and maybe you can take a day and you can take months. Emails, it's all about. I had an image before coming here, mm -hmm. an image in my head. Mm -hmm. But when I arrived, the, the setting and the space also gave me a different image. I kind of had to listen to the film and find the right character that fits the film. And then, you know, just just play with it. Um, so do you do studies, sketches? No, I used to do studies. But now it's like everything starts in the head. Like I would do the study in the head, play with the colors, and then see which one fits. The most like for me the important thing is to already know the size at which I want to work, like the scale. And once that is locked in, I know I will have to, I will just have to find the image that fits into that size and then just work from there. And so I will, I will do all the things, like prepare everything in my head. Once I get it, when I come, it's just a matter of finishing the sketch and getting the sketch right, and then just play with the cut. Okay. So I will, I, you know, I paint before I paint. So when I will come, it's already done. I mean, I have moments where I get stuck in between, but in this case, it's like, I know it's just one piece that I'm doing, and I know exactly the feeling I want what when I paint it. And yeah, it so happened that we had this long chair uh, bench. Yeah. And I asked if the bench was going to stay. And he said yes. And I was like, okay. Then I know exactly what I want to do because I wanted a painting where I'm not going to be all the time. But when you sit down and you watch, you have the feeling that I'm also watching. Mm -hmm. and so leaving a bit of me here. Kind of. So that's how, that's how I do it. And can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I know that you mentioned that you would like for the viewer or the audience to kind of feel that energy that you have when you're making these works in the studio. And really be transported to the moment where you're, as I said, sculpting the skin. You know? Why is that important that the viewer really kind of be engulfed in this experience with this new thing. I mean, I just want to share the experience of making the work with others. Mm. I mean, if if I can, I will be doing a lot of studio visits or like you know, will be in the studio space for me to work so they can also enjoy the process. But you know, I can't do it. So I like to think of a way that I can share that experience. Plus it also gives me that freedom that I want, or that freeness and playfulness that I want my characters to have. And also, I mean, if you look at this painting, you can clearly see what the two characters have it. And, and that's how I want to see it, that, you know, you kind of see the work, you don't have to work extra hard to remember the image. You just see it and it stays. Mm -hmm. Because it's that simple. Um, going back to sculpting the skin and creating um, a narrative and discourse that you feel should be in the world. How uh, you talk about freedom a lot. I mean, could you expand on like what does that mean for you as an artist to make what you want to make devoid of the gaze of any other person, but really being an author of a, a point of view, an aesthetic, a conversation? I should be yeah. I mean, I talk about freedom because I feel like you know every person should have that. That should be the struggle, but. Where I come from, you, know, you have to struggle to get it. And being an artist, you know, it's really long and tough journey. And, you know, I feel like the, this, you know, the, here there is something that you know when you work hard, you're going to get it. But by and by, it's not there. So I feel like, you know, I would want to be able to create something that's soft about there as well. To kind of know that whatever of things or whatever jobs that you are doing, there is something in terms of art, there is something to report to. You know, not always look forward to work. 
want to pick up on that. I want to ask you, how did you work through the hard times, the, the frozen pizza? Because you, you couldn't have predicted, obviously you have faith and belief in your practice and you love what you do, but there are moments of frustration or challenges. How did you personally find the motivation to push through? I mean, I was in Vienna in 2013. I did a small show, it was quite successful. So moving back to Vienna, I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna continue my career. But it was, it was funny how the, the space just rejected me mm. um, from you know, liking my work to not wanting to show African art. Mm. And you know, it, it changed everything. You know, I, I was studying, you don't really have a job, so you have to do the little that you have. I had a lot of pizza. Um, <laughs> and you know, I was just finding ways to not throw it away, but do something with it. And then I, I mean, of, also money was a struggle, so you cannot just go and buy canvas. You have to, you know, play with the materials you have. So I started like putting them together and just painting on it. And so is that how you started with some of these paperworks? Yeah, I mean, because that was what's, what was available at the time. Yes, 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 yes. Paper was the cheapest material so I some could. Some of them, like, particularly with, um, um, I think, uh, Reflections yeah, 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you really look at some of the work, you'll see some of the, more of the papers, less the canvases that are drawn. Oh, even Thelma. Which one? Thelma, the red, Thelma and Red Race. For yes. Example. Yeah, that has. The one that's drawn. So paper was one of the cheapest material, and I wanted to, like, you know, experiment more, and canvas was expensive, so there's no way I could, you know, do canvas. So I buy a lot of paper, and then I put them together with to the size that I basically want to work. Sometimes bigger, and then I cut around it. But so paper was one of the materials that I experimented a lot on mm -hmm. before, you know, anything happened. We talk a lot about community. Um, can you talk about what community means to you, one? And then two, how has your outlook evolved knowing that in terms of contemporary artists, you've been a major catalyst in the interest in African artists, West African artists, West African painters? Like how do you, how do you, navigate that pressure? It's a lot, but I also feel grateful to be part of that. Um, I feel like there have been a lot of, like there have been some people who did it. If they hadn't been there, we probably would not be here today. Uh, but I'm quite happy that, you know, the, the dream of painting is alive on the continent, and I'm part of the ones that you know made it happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a lot to have to deal with, but I think I feel more happy doing it. And then now you're in the process of um, starting your foundation, your residency. Can you tell people a little bit about that? Show people want to support, um, and why was it important for you to start this project? And the project is in this neighborhood. You know, so we talk about buying back the block, and he's literally doing that. But every time I go visit him in his neighborhood, there's another property that's been purchased that's going to be used for artists or a creative space. And for me, um, it's simply mind-blowing to see him, you know, put his resources where his mouth is and his intention. I think it would be nice to have an art district because almost every city in the west that I visit, there's an art district, there's a district where there's, there's galleries, museums, da, 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 and I feel like it would be nice to have something back home like that. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, it would be easy if the government does it, but, you know, 
Uh, so I, I do the best that I can. Uh, the artist residency is one of many of things that I want to do. Um, it is to, you know, create that space for artists to come and experiment and also give them an idea how, you know, a gallery space could also look like when they show in the right spaces. Uh, it is also a space where it's just gonna give them access to you know, endless resources of art books to look at, things to read, uh, have access to critics who will come around and have a conversation. It is, it's just a space where it's gonna build them to whatever is out there to, to be ready for. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And bringing it back to Houston, um, we have this beautiful crowd that's come far and wide what, and, and I don't want this to sound prescriptive, but what do you invite the viewers to consider when they look at your work? What questions do you hope they ask or think about when they see your work? Well, they should, they should know that um, I'm with them, I'm staring at them, and I'm in their brains, so. <laughs> They better ask the right questions. Um, this is my last question, then I'll open it up to the audience. Did you ever foresee this when you were in your old school or your apartment in No, no, no. Like, it's. I don't want to say what's the end goal because I feel like that's like <laughs> absolute. But like, how does it feel to know? Because I think also there's a misconception that this happened overnight. We were talking the other day, like when he was making this, because I like literally went to lunch, came back, and was done. Like when he was saying to me and Nina, he was like, you know, I prepared 20 years to do this, so like. It shouldn't be that difficult. Like once I know what I want to do, you know, and you talk a lot about once the sketch is down, the painting is done. Yeah. Right. And so one thing I definitely invite you all to do is really spend time with the painting, study them. Um, every so often, he'll leave you a, a clue in terms of sketch, line work, pencil work. Um, there's a couple of the works like Green Clutch where. He's inviting you to kind of imagine what that, what color that lens could be. Um, but yeah, because for me working on this was a lot, you know. But it was a joy to do because I learned. But I'm just curious, you know, as an artist, and, and, and you struggle, you know, to find that freedom to make the work you want to make make a living doing it, and then now within an institutional context here in Houston. Um, and I think it's like 33, 34 works. Like, when you reflect on like all the steps it took to get here, like, how do you, how do you do it? I mean, first of all, I'll, I mean, I haven't seen that many, I mean, I know I did all the work, but I haven't <laughs> seen them. <laughs> I haven't seen them in, 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 like all, all together. Mm -hmm. And so seeing the progress from where I started to where I am now, it's, it's a big shift. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work that I had, you know, put in to, to be able to get here. And, you know, I want people to spend time and, you know, just know that it just didn't happen over time, like mm -hmm. overnight. We got merch. I should have mm -hmm. pointed up here, I'm not a good salesman. Um, we got tote bags, we got pillows, we got a puzzle that he somehow figured out, him and Nina, how to put together, um, postcards. So a lot of um, material to commemorate this experience, because this is history that you're all witnessing. And I think, you know, it's been interesting to talk to a lot of the staff who have been here for many years, and they say, oh, Glenn Lightman did a show here, and it's just like to know that Marco's name is amongst 
all these incredible luminaries for you is special. And so thank you again, and you stand thank you to everyone who has been part of making this happen. Um, and with that, we're done. <laughs> thank you. Oh. And of course, I got to thank the Marco. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. Um,